Hi, welcome to another episode of the Sankofa Pan African series. So, just what are the legacies of slavery? Our guest today will be helping us to understand how universities were entangled in the slave trade. But before we meet this erudite scholar and uh, poet, please continue to support us by clicking on your subscription and notification buttons. Thank you. Dr. Afua Cooper holds a PhD in Black Canadian Studies and the African Diaspora from the University of uh, Toronto. She's a tenured full-time professor at Dalhousie University's Department of Sociology and uh, Social Anthropology with cross appointments in the Department of History and Gender and Women's Studies. Dr. Cooper is a multidisciplinary scholar and artist whose contributions to society includes the literary arts, history, humanities, education, and human and civil rights. Her 12 books range across genres as um, history, uh, poetry, fiction, and children's literature. Dr. Cooper served as the poet laureate of Halifax Regional Municipality between 2018 and 2020. Welcome to the Sankofa Pan-African series, Dr. Afua Cooper. It's a real pleasure having you uh, on the series. Thank you. <laughs> we keep hearing, we hear this word all the time, triangular trade. What is the triangular uh, slave trade? So the triangular uh, trade or the triangular, triangular slave trade speaks to a trading system that in, in theory and in practice was premised on the, the, um, the this Atlantic slaving system that connected three points in, within the At Atlantic world. Mm -hmm. And so why it's used a lot or why it's used to capture this, um, the essence of the slaving system was because the, the as, as I said, was premised on three points. So let's say the, the first point begins and first point could begin anywhere, right? So we're talking about Europe, we're talking about West Africa, we're talking about the Americas. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, manufactured goods would be taken from Europe. So that's pots, pans, um, cloth, fabric, guns, gunpowder, bullets, taken to, to West Africa, where these items were um, exchanged for captive Africans who were then loaded on ships in the bottom of ships, taken across the Atlantic Ocean, um, which is um, the area is called the Middle Passage. It's a stretch of sea between West Africa and, and the Americas. So captive Africans were then taken across the Atlantic to the so-called New World, to Virginia, to Jamaica, to Brazil, to Antigua, to Barbados, where they were sold to plantation owners. And these people, um, would then produce the, the tropical goods um, or, or the tropical crops, the sugarcane, the cotton, um, the rice, et cetera, that the planters in the new world would send to Europe. And sometimes in the same slave ship, so if the slave ship arrives, let's say in Jamaica, they would clean, up, clean out the ship because you can imagine the condition, the, just the filth, Mm. on the ship, they would clean it, um, disinfect it, and load the sugar, for example, in barrels, the rum, the molasses, and ship these items to Europe. So it, it, this trade speaks to the connection of, of the three points, and it repeats itself. It's a, a system that really continued, was in continuous motion over the course of three, four centuries. Um, uh, the essence of it was the brutalization, the abuse, the criminal brutalization of Black people, of Black people's bodies, of captive Africans, 
who were enslaved, who had their labor robbed from them. And not just their specific individual labor, but this robbery was generational. You know, it happened over the course of several centuries, as I've said before. Uh, another point on this, uh, a, a very important point is that it's from this system that the wealth of the world you know, was built. The wealth of Europe was built. Europe exported the, the items, the goods that they were produced, produced by free African labor to the rest of the world, literally, and built its wealth and got its power from this trading system. So, you know, I, I, I always say to people that the labor the, of Africans built this world, and not just our labor, but our, our intellectual our intellectual prow prowess, they stole our, because our intellect is also capital and mm -hmm. that was also stolen from us to produce wealth for white people. We bring you to the ne my next question because slavery ended on paper, but the legacies of slavery and the slave trade are still with us. What are some of those legacies? The legacies are, are manifold, they are, numerous. Mm -hmm. And I, I will just speak to a few because as you said, when slavery ended legally um, and, and officially, you didn't have black equality. Black people were still not equal to white people. They didn't enjoy the, the rights and privileges of the society that they themselves helped to build. So, you know, in the Canadian parliament, I think a week ago, they um, officialized Emancipation Day. Uh, Emancipation Day in the British imperial world was August 1st. Mm. Um, August 1st, 1834, the enslaved people in most parts of the British colonial world were, were freed by you know, this act of the Westminster Parliament. And so the Canadian government recently declared August 1st an official day for celebration across the country. Even though, you know, black people in Canada and, and the Caribbean have been celebrating Emancipation Day yes. since 1834. But at the same time, the, so it officialized the, the ending of slavery. But at the same time, it took another 100 years, for, for example, in the British Caribbean for black people to be able to vote. And they got that because of rebellion. They rebelled the, eight, the 1938 labor riots and strikes in the British Caribbean. When slavery ended, what was, what was reinstated was a system of what some people call racial apartheid. So they, they removed the chains, they said you're free, but the white planter class or the white ruling class still maintained, still held on to the realms, reins of power. They were dominant in the political world. They still controlled the economy. They controlled the land. And land in that time was the basis, and still in this time, was the basis of, of um, um, wealth in order to create wealth and empowerment. Um, they controlled all the, the reins of society. They held on to the reins that would make, um, that could, if they, if they just released it even a little, Black people would have been able to acquire what was necessary to, you know, to self-actualize. And so, so they held on to these things and they knew exactly what they were doing because they, they knew that August 2nd, 1834, the day after the act was passed, that Black people would still have to return to the fields to labor, mm -hmm. right? Because... <laughs> You know, one of the crimes that the, the British government committed against the black community was that they released the slaves or the enslaved people, but they paid compensation to the white masters, to the owners. They believed so much in this notion of property and they believed so much that black people were property. And it's not, you know, it's intrinsic in British common law to recognize the property principle and so they said, well, these white planters, they have lost their property. We must compensate them. Mm. The property were the enslaved people, mm. but they didn't give the property anything. So even though Emancipation Act was passed, it was such a racist piece of legislation because once again, it, um, it, <laughs> it, it reconfirmed what 
what white people had been thinking for a century that black people were not quite human, that they were property. Mm. And in doing so by not giving, I mean, in the British world, black people have been slaving for, for the Brits for over 250 years. Mm. And when emancipation came, they didn't even give them a dollar and say, hey, go do your thing, do whatever, here's some little money, nothing. So one of the legacies is this second class citizenship that, as you said, is still playing out today. There's this feeling of unbelonging, like we still don't belong in these societies. And, you know, in the United States, emancipation happened 1865, in Brazil, 1888. And still in all these societies, including Canada, you see Black people still having a second class, a third class kind of citizenship because we are, we are still not fully incorporated into the body politic. That is why you could have the public murder of George Floyd and many others like him, yeah. because we are still not seen as full citizens of whichever country. Yeah. And it leads me into the second um, um, point of one of the other legacies of slavery is that of mass incarceration. Mm. You see the disproportionate impact of the criminal justice system on black bodies, right? In, and I'm, we're speaking now of Canada, certainly it happens in other parts of the world, in Jamaica, in Brazil, in the United States, but in Canada, we see this phenomenon. We know that over the past 10 years, the incarceration rate of black people, especially black men in the federal prison system has increased by 50%. Now, Black people only make up something like 2.3% of the total Canadian population. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, you know, that links to our <laughs> citizenship status, which is mm -hmm. citizenship minus or, you know, there's this book called um, Citizens Minus. The, the third um, point I want to bring is the, the health impact. And this flows directly from slavery. During mm. the enslavement period, um, the diet of, of Black people, the enslaved people was terrible. High, high in, in, in sugar content, high in salt content. In the Caribbean, for example, we have, and, and this is a fact, which, you, which is, you can easily verify, the highest rate of diabetes, mm. right? We also in the Caribbean have the highest rate of um, um, what you call it when you have to take off people's limbs, dismemberment because of diabetes complications. So, you know, especially the, 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 the feet, toes, right? Um, we also suffer high rates of diabetes, as I said. We are found of cancers, yeah, hypertension, yeah. AIDS, HIV, and, and no. COVID-19. I mean, Black people in Canada, <laughs> you know, are at the top um, of the, uh, of the, the pile, the, the, the top of this ladder when it comes to um, who is suffering the most from COVID-19, who are the victims, people who are dying, people who are infected, and who are the frontline workers, especially in the health field and the retail industry. These are a black community. A third impact is segregation. You know, as I've said, after emancipation happened, um, you had legal segregation, whether that was Jim Crow in the United States or the, the color bar in Canada. So uh, bl the black schools were, uh, were segregated, it's the school system. Um, the government passed in various places in Canada, passed these school acts that segregated uh, black learners, cemeteries were segregated, mm. churches, um, and, and just a lack of employment opportunities. Uh, even if you're very qualified, you have a PhD, you have the credentials, there's so much difficulty in finding work. There's some, what one could call good legacies. And I'm speaking about the area of culture. So in terms of food, um, cuisine, fashion, art, literature, music. So every music, every form of music within the Americas, mm. every single one, <laughs> um, popular music um, came from Africa, came out of the slavery experience, whether it's salsa, whether it's 
bachata, whether it's merengue, Look. whether it's reggae, mm. whether it's um, a soca, uh, you j- jazz, blues, hip hop, rap, mm. dance hall, you name it. It all came out of the slave experience. Unfortunately, in most cases, black people are not the beneficiaries yeah. <laughs> of, of um, you, you, you know, the wealth yeah. that that's accrued from these industries. We have what I call, you know, the vulturization of our culture. Other people take it, they benefit from it. I mean, if you think of who really owns the music industry in North America, yeah. it's not the rappers, it's not the, the black singers, it's, it's other people, it's white people, predominantly white men who run the music industry, who accrue the millions and billions, who own the masters mm. of, of these um, artists and musicians. So as much as this could be seen as a good legacy, we have imprinted ourselves in in, in culture in North America and the rest of the Americas. We're the leaders in popular culture. It's our music that makes um, um, things happen. If you look at the the leading musicians, artists, Michael Jackson, Beyonce, Prince, Peter Tosh, um, so on and so forth. For, they, they, they're the ones who drive the industry or who have driven the industry. Which also now brings me to my next question, because it's very easy for Canadians to say, oh, the role that Canada played, you know, in slavery was not as uh, bad as um, other places. And usually the focus is on the underground um, train system. Right. Can we look at specific ways, you know, in which um, the colonial economy in the Maritimes, so places like Nova Scotia, in Canada generally, where you have studied, how you know they made their wealth, how the colonial uh, uh, economy was uh, riding on the back of slavery and slave trade. Thank you. That, that thank you for the question. And, and you've used the right word, it's the or right, right phrase. It's a colonial economy. We, you know, so there are these various colonies around the Atlantic world, you know, British colonies, sometimes French, Dutch, Spanish, but we'll just stick to the, the, the British world. And so if I'll just give one example, and this is how Nova Scotia and the Maritime were inserted in, in the slaving system, in the British slaving system. So you have the Maritimes uh, colonies, you know, in, in Eastern Canada, sitting on the shores of the Atlantic Ocean, down the road is, or the, down the sea roads, um, are the Caribbean colonies. They are, sl- they are predominantly slave colonies. And you did have slavery within the Maritimes too. But the Maritimes was a poorer part of Canada. Mm. And so it needed, it needed, as we say in Jamaican language, it needed a forward. And how did the Maritimes get that forward? They got it through the, the Caribbean slavery system. When I say they needed a forward, they needed a way to create wealth. And so they inserted themselves in the Atlantic um, commercial system and in the global commercial system by trading with the Caribbean slave plantations. And this is how they did it. Um, in the Maritimes, what do we have fish. We are, we are by the sea, yes. <laughs> we have fish. Um, and so they exported dried fish, whether it's cod, herring, um, mackerel, haddock, et cetera, to the Caribbean colonies to feed um, the enslaved people. So these were the main protein sources, the cod and herring of enslaved people. Hence the, you know, the high salt content, we're talking about the hypertension and so on, because they salted it in order to preserve it. That fed the slaves. They all, the Maritimes also exported beef, pork, all salted, mm. horses, timber, staves, lumber, wheat flour to the Caribbean um, slave plantations. What did they get in exchange for the, the maritime products that were sent um, down south to the Caribbean? They um, got the maritime businessmen, they got rum, sugar, molasses, coffee, cocoa, all of the goods that were produced by slave labor. And that is how, you know, you have a coterie of merchants, whether it was in Newfoundland, 
Nova Scotia, Prince Edward Island, and New Brunswick, who gained their wealth, who made their fortunes um, from this trade. So basically, the maritime economy was premised on the backs of enslaved Caribbean people. And um, the, the, the blood, you know, when we say what the blood, sweat, and tears of enslaved people, I am also speaking in a literal way. Yeah. Because so many times when the, the sugar was being produced, so you had the molasses, you had the cane juice, and you boil it, you had to boil it mm. to thicken it, and then it eventually crystallizes to become sugar. But that, that was a very labor intensive task. Mm -hmm. It was done in, in the boiling houses and um, at night. And so many times, the, the person who is like feeding the mill is, is drowsy mm -hmm. because he or she had been standing there for hours during the night. And they sometimes their arm would get caught mm -hmm. in the mill, the rotating mill. And in order to prevent the whole body from being dragged into the mill, there was a, a, a person, another enslaved person, or it could be a, a white person who was standing there with a machete and they would chop off the arm. And so the blood, the, the arm, everything would be crushed, would be grinded up, would mm -hmm. be part of the, you know, the semi-liquid. And so, you know, that person who chops off the arm, that was actually a job. Mm. That was a job within the, the sugar making um, system. There's a person there standing with a machete to chop off that arm if that arm get, gets caught. So when I say it's the blood, sweat and tears, I really mean it in a literal way. So that sugar comes up to Nova Scotia, comes up to New Brunswick, comes up to Newfoundland and wherever else, Quebec, Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, and is consumed by everybody, whether it's the governor of the province or the simple, the ordinary, humble farmer, yeoman, the school teacher, by everybody, by every sector of society. This discussion will be continued in the next episode. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the Sankofa Pan African series channel. Like our videos and please share them with your contacts.